Lawrence, Montana. Um, so river floodplains are really complex, multi-dimensional systems. Um, they're, not, they're made up of not only the main channel, but also the flooding areas around them, and also their associated aquifers that oftentimes. So the aquifer is where the groundwater is stored, and these are very complex areas. There's an oxygen gradient with more shallow areas being, of course, higher in oxygen and the deeper areas being lower in oxygen. There's also low amounts of dissolved organic carbon and low nutrients in general. So they're kind of complex habitats for the organisms that reside there. Um, understanding these floodplains and aquifers are important areas of research for a number of different reasons, including better understanding the connections that exist allow us to better understand the dispersal capabilities of the organisms that reside there, both across a uh, temporal range and a spatial range. It also allows us to increase our knowledge of the aquifer's biodiversity as a whole. Um, this is something that's hard to kind of get a good picture of since the aquifer is um, beneath our feet. It's hard to understand what organisms are residing there. Um, learning more about them and what populations may be at risk can also allow us to add them to lists such as the IUCN Red List um, if they are in danger. It also allows us to talk about groundwater conservation. Areas, especially in the Northwest and West in general, there's high use um, both agriculturally and recreational of the river and the aquifer. And so we need to conserve these spaces, especially if they are high in biodiversity. And lastly, we can better understand how organisms evolve and adapt over time to different conditions, including these uh, aquifer and groundwater conditions. Um, the, getting right into my study site, this is the Flathead River. It's in northwest Montana, right near Glacier National Park. For those of you familiar with the area, it's uh, very beautiful there. The river is made up of three different forks, the north, the middle, and the south fork. The north fork originates in Canada and then travels south until it joins with both the middle and the south fork before the city of Kalispell. It then empties into Flathead Lake and eventually joins with the Clark Fork River. The Flathead Aquifer itself has been the area of research for many decades, especially by a researcher named Dr. Jack Stanford um, and his associates at Flathead Lake Biological Station. Um, this research uh, varies widely from chemistry studies to biogeochemistry to biodiversity studies, and all of these are kind of pointing to how vulnerable this system is to both climate change and habitat destruction, which is unfortunate because it has a diverse invertebrate community made up of both amphibiomes and stegobiomes. Amphibiomes are organisms that spend only part of their life cycle um, within the aquifer, such as stoneflies, which uh, may have a larval stage in the aquifer and then emerge um, and have a terrestrial life stage as well. And there's also stegobiomes, and stegobiomes reside within the aquifer for their entire life cycle. Um, one such genus of stegobiome is stegobromus. They're pretty adorable. They're pale, pigmentless organisms that lack eyes. This is common for uh, most stegobionts since they're um, under the ground and don't really um, need them. Uh, they, there's over 200 described species, almost all of them done by one researcher, uh, Dr. Chris Swinger. And um, they're almost all located along the east coast of the United States. There's very few described species in the west in general. There's only five described species in Montana, and these are all about 100 miles south from the populations that we have found. They're also known to be from cave systems, so they're just really interesting in general. Um, these are all the populations um, on the map on the right of the locations we have found them in the Flathead River. So we found populations along the North, Middle, and South Fork, as well as in the city of Kalispell. These sites are PPC pipe wells that go about 20 feet into the ground and have slots throughout them, and we access them by pumping water out using a hose and pump system. So that's how we found um, all of these different populations of Stigobromus in the flathead. But how these are all related and structured to each other, and if they might be different species, is the question of my thesis, along with a bunch of other questions, but I'm going to focus on the genetic structure for this talk. Um, Stigobromus is especially interesting if you look into any of the molecular work that has been done on them in the past 10 years. Cryptic speciation has been found to be pretty common. So species that look morphologically similar or identical um, have actually been found to be entirely different species. So um, we wanted to look into these populations in particular to see um, how structured and related they were. To answer this question,
classroom, we've been using reduced representation sequencing through RASI, which uses restriction enzymes to um, cut up the genome. We have 365 individuals total across those 12 populations along the Flathead River. And to build and then process the loci um, after sequencing, I've been using the STACS program. And the first few analyses I've run so far have been structure, club back, and then I'm sure you guys also use a bunch of R packages as well. Getting right into the, those results, this is the immediate output of a DAPC. Um, so this one looks pretty good because it's the immediate um, output. So the program has found three distinct genetic clusters in all the individuals we found. Um, hypothetically, we would have thought if we color code these to represent where they originally came from, these would be the three forks of the river. So um, each cluster would be like the North Fork and the Middle Fork and the South Fork. But when you actually ask the program to color code from where they came from, you get a <laughs> really messy figure. Um, I've color coded them, so all the blue dots are individuals from different spots on the North Fork. All of the red, orange, and yellow are individuals from sites along the Middle Fork. The green are individuals from the city of Kalispell. And purple and black are the ones from the South Fork. I'm going to talk through them so you don't have to memorize this too much. So once you remove a couple of populations that had really low sample sizes and those that were super divergent across all three clusters, um, you do start to see some nice patterns emerging, um, starting with the North Fork site. This is the most northern site we have in our field study. Um, it's right um, at the Canadian border almost. And as you can see, all the individuals from this site are essentially clustering together. Also clustering together are three sites along the Middle Fork. And these are individuals in what's known as the Nyack floodplain, and all of them are clustering well. Also clustering well are the two sites we have in the city of Kalispell, um, minus a few here and there. Looking at the individuals that aren't clustering well, it's um, several sites along the North Fork and also sites along the South Fork. Um, these are due to low sample sizes, but um, the South Fork in particular, we're not sure why we're not seeing distinct clustering from them. Um, given it has a large population size, so that's something we're hoping to investigate in the coming weeks. Getting right into my structure results, I've uh, put up k equals 2 and k equals 3. k equals 2 was found to be the best value of k, but I've included 3, so you can see that patterns kind of continue across. Um, walking you through this, the first four on your left are sites from the North Fork, and then we have the Middle Fork sites, the Kalispell sites, and the South Fork sites. Again, we're seeing some distinct clustering and some distinct groups happening. And they are from these six uh, populations here. Again, it's the most northern site along the North Fork River, the three sites along the Middle Fork of the river in the Nyack floodplain, and the two sites from Kalispell that are really distinguished from all the others. The rest are kind of messy, and these are the same populations that were kind of messy in the uh, previous figure. Jumping from this to um, some FST values that I've run recently, the average pairwise FST value that I found was 0.03 across all sites. Looking specifically at those three sites in the Nyack floodplain of the Middle Fork, we get 0.01, which is quite low. Um, when we compare this to another site along the Middle Fork, so the same fork of the river, it's 0.04, just above the average. And then it's 0.06 compared to the uh, North Fork sites, again, 0.06 double the average for Kalispell sites, and 0.07 for the South Fork sites. Plotting all of these FST values into a tree, you can distinctly see how different these Middle Fork sites are, showing some kind of isolation happening um, along this Nyack floodplain along the Middle Fork of the river. So to just quickly summarize the results I've shown you, um, the DAPC structure and FST values are showing um, some population structure within these sites, specifically the most northern site along the North Fork of the river, the Nyack floodplain sites along the Middle Fork of the river, and the Kalispell sites, um, which is the city after all three of the forks of the river have combined. Um, some interesting findings that we're hoping to investigate further, as I've said, are differences between sites along the same fork of the river, which we weren't expecting to find, and also investigating why the South Fork isn't showing distinct clustering when those populations seem to be quite geographically isolated from all the other ones. Uh, my next steps, hopefully, are to run some isolation by distance tests. 
some outlier analyses to look for any selection that might be occurring. Um, we also hope to continue phylogenetics work and then look into CO1 sequencing to confirm that these are all from one species and not um, cryptic speciation or multiple species included within. And then I'll just take a quick moment to acknowledge all the help I've received from Bucknell University um, along with Flathead Lake Biological Station, my advising <coughs> committee, um, and those that help me both in the field and with my library prep. Okay. away though seem to be the ones that are kind of messy so we're hoping to figure out why those are if there's some kind of systematic error in those data that are creating that before proceeding with looking at geographical distance.